Good morning or good afternoon everyone, depending on where you're joining us from and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sam Moulton from the Business Review and I will be your host. It's our pleasure to have Burkert with us today who will be discussing surface acoustic wave technology. Today's guest speaker is John Van Loon, Segment Manager Hygienic. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar platform on 24. You notice that this webinar is browser based, so if you disconnect at any point, just click the link you receive via email to rejoin. In order to ask questions for the Q&A section that follows the presentation, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen or type this into the Q&A box at the top left hand corner of your screen. Uh, we'll allocate you yeah, around 10 or 15 minutes after the presentation to try and address as many of these as we can. If you require help at any point, you can click on the yellow help widget. You can move and resize and maximize any of the windows in front of you. But now, without further ado, please allow me to welcome John. John, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sam. Um, <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Um, today, we're going to speak about surface acoustic wave. Um, we put a nice agenda together. Um, first of all, to speak about the properties of an ideal flow meter. Um, discuss a little bit about the existing technology, uh, existing technologies, and then rapidly into the surface acoustic wave technology. Um, from that, uh, with its, which is quite theoretical, we will go into the industrialization of this technology and the applications we can use this type of technology in. So, first of all. Um, why are, you, are we looking for an ideal flow meter? Well, actually the uh, existing flow measurements have weaknesses or limits in usage, um, or they're extremely expensive. And there's already uh, a lot of uh, flow meters in the market, um, and they're very well established. So. Develop an identical technology does not bring any new advantages for, for you as a user. Um, going shortly to the properties of an ideal flow meter, um, the interesting thing there is that um, uh, we did not succeed with this technology to cover the full existing program of flow meters, but I think we got quite far. Um, so typically we're looking for a flow sensor with no moving parts, uh, which uh, is a multi-parameter device, doesn't have any ceilings in the measurement, uh, no liners, no parts in the measuring tube, um, is insensitive for magnetic and electrical disturbances, um, and that electrical and thermic, mechanical and fluidic properties of the medium doesn't have influence on the measurement. Um, Adding to that, what we would like to have is a, a device which has a very large measurement range, um, start measuring directly, um, has a high sampling rate, um, it's usable for a wide range of markets and applications, um, and specifically for my uh, segment, hygienic, uh, must fulfill hygienic design and requirements in this field. So typically, the existing technologies in this field used are Coriolis, electric magnetic field, and ultrasonic. And looking at um, Coriolis, I would say this is a very interesting technology with um, quite high accuracy. It's a multi-parameter device, and the interesting part, I would say, is that it's um, measuring directly mass instead of flow. Um, so it has really some, some huge advantages. Um, the disadvantages of this technology is, I would say, the dimensions, the size, mounting length, and also the weight. Um, it has a disadvantage of the pressure loss and as well the installation recommendations. Um, from a hygienic design point of view, um, you have to consider a lot to install this device in a proper way. And then the last disadvantage, I would say, is the price. It's a quite expensive device. With all the advantages, it might be okay, 
but still the price level is very high compared to other technologies. Then electromagnetic fields or mag meters as they call them, um, here the price is not really the issue. Um, the competition is there much bigger and um, it's much lower in price than Coriolis and, and as ultrasonic as well. Um, the accuracy down to 0.2%, so a little bit less than, than Coriolis, but um, I would say still acceptable for a lot of applications. There's nearly no pressure loss, which is really an advantage. Um, and there is enough uh, tube cross-section to clean, like, like CIP or SIP. Uh, there are no movable parts in the tube, um, uh, and it's, I would say, a really reliable proved flow meter. Uh, disadvantage, um, I would say number one, would be that you need a liquid conductivity of, of uh, at least five microsiemens per, per centimeter. Um, another part is that electrodes are in contact with the medium. There's a ceiling inside. It needs a liner. You need crowding rings for installation. Um, so, uh, for the remote version, um, you need a special cable. So there are some disadvantages to this technology as well. But number one, I would say, is the liquid conductivity. Um, and then, of course, we got ultrasonic. Um, uh, we got two versions, um, but typically you got a big range for this uh, ultrasonic device, uh, up to 3.3% accuracy. Uh, it's not in contact with the media. Um, there are no moving parts. Um, you can go up to like DN4000 with this clamp-on version. Um, you have short inlet sections. It's robust. Uh, with the version inline, it, it's a guaranteed accuracy. So there are some, some advantages. Disadvantages of this type of technology is that the accuracy of smaller diameters decreases a lot. Um, there is one beam. There are some special versions, but there's only one beam, so any uh, change in the media can can influence the accuracy of this uh, of this measurement. Um, another disadvantage is, I would say, the the validation uh, of of this system, especially the the clamp-on version. Uh, that's quite difficult to um, to do so. Um, um, so you really need a specialist to install this clamp-on version in your in your device. You need an expert to that. Um, so this was shortly the the introduction of the existing technologies, um, and we got some some questions for you first. Um, maybe later this will change your mind. Um, maybe I can hand them over to you, Sam. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's time for the first of today's polling questions we're running in today's session. Uh, just select the answer that's relevant to you by clicking the circle next to it and then click Submit. Um, so yeah, the first question today is, which existing technologies are you currently using most? And is it A, Coriolis, B, EMF, C, Ultrasonic, or D, Other? Uh, John, if you could just sort of talk around this question in order to give the attendees a little longer to vote. Yeah, of course. Um, well, t typically the technologies we are looking looking uh, for are used in the in the hygienic segment we are active in, um, like in pharma, food and beverage, or in in cosmetic applications. Um, we do see all uh, of these um, technologies used. Maybe specifically to your to your system, it would be interesting to see what type of type of technology you uh, you are using and you are familiar with. Okay, thank you very much. Hopefully, everyone's had uh, long enough to vote there. So I'll move over to the results page. And yeah, it's pretty close, but other and Coriolis have a uh, split there slightly more. If you just comment on this before carrying on with your presentation. Yeah, okay. Um, well, interesting to see that the EMF and the ultrasonic is the same. I would expect uh, electromagnetic field to be a little bit higher. Um, 
but um, okay, that's an interesting, interesting voting, I would say. Uh, Coriolis is, is for me uh, clear in this industry. Uh, Coriolis is used quite a lot, uh, specifically because of this you know, the parameter device and the accuracy. Uh, so yeah, it's good, good, good feedback. Thanks. Um, now coming to to the, te the technology and and the explanation of the technology, and it's going to be kind of theoretical, but I hope I can explain it in in a, in a quite in a nice manner. So um, the surface acoustic wave was already uh, explained in 1885 by Lord Rayleigh, and um, he was uh, he was able to to explain a phenomenon which couldn't be explained before. Um, and he made a mathematical formula for that. And actually, we are using a mathematical formula, a part of that mathematical formula in, the, in our technology to measure flow. So um, what he, what he uh, just saw is that um, what you see here is is that you, there are longitud longitudinal waves and transverse waves, and um, it's not sure if you can see it, but um, when you see the picture, uh, the top picture, the dots are moving from the left to right, and here you see actually a wave traveling through a solid, um, but the dots are moving only from the left to the right. And in the middle picture, what you see there is uh, moving the dots from down to up and up to down, only in that direction. And then when you're looking at the third picture, because I'm not sure if it's moving now or not, um, no, it's not moving. Um, the interesting thing here is that the yellow dots you can see uh, at the first 20% of the layer, and this is actually what's happening du during an earthquake, um, the yellow dot is moving in an elliptical shape uh, anti-clockwise. And the second yellow dot is moving um, clockwise in an ellipse. And that's exactly the part Mr. Rayleigh um, explained in this mathematical formula. Now, why is that interesting for us? Um, first of all, this, uh, this has been used for uh, a long time, um, uh, for example, to determine the epicenter of earthquakes or for geophysics and geotechnical engineering. Um, so, uh, for example, they send these uh, uh, surface acoustic waves into the earth and then they can see the difference in the sound of speed through this uh, earth layer and then obviously they can find uh, like oil or or other metals in this in this area. Uh, later in the 50s, they started to use this surface acoustic wave device as a bandpass filter in TVs and radio, and now um, they use it uh, typically in phones a lot. In 2010, they already used about uh, three billion high-end surface acoustic wave devices in in cell phones. And I would say you probably have one on your table right now. So it's already a technology used in uh, different applications for already a long time. So what you see here now is um, is on the left the relay wave, and on the right um, you see the uh, lamp wave going. Um, and the relay wave is only on the top, and the lamp wave. That one is going on uh, on both sides because that's the interesting part we are using. When you take only the top layer of this wave and you take a tube or a wall or a plate, you got on both sides this wave, and that wave propagates through the metal, through the solid. Now, to give a little bit better explanation, um, here you see a Slieren optical picture. So this picture is not moving anymore. This is done by 
by a kind of laser picture. Um, so let's analyze what we see here. Um, on the left you see the white part and the white part is where the interdigital transducer is introducing the lamp wave. And when you're following the tube, you see that the tube is, um, is, is creating a wave. It's creating like a bubble surface. And at the end, it will be lower. And then it disappears because it's losing its energy. And in the middle, you got the liquid. Now, what you typically see here is um, the lamp wave grow going through the solid. But you see also these interesting white beams. And these white beams are something different. These are not lamp waves. These are not waves traveling through a solid. These are waves traveling through a liquid. And that's a completely different wave. But let me come back to that later. First of all, we need to define um, what the dispersion is. And that's the thing you need to have to make sure that um, your device is giving you the right information. So um, when you're looking at this um, uh, dispersion, uh, you take the wall thickness and the type of material and the frequency, and with that, um, you can calculate the speed of sound of this lamp wave traveling through the solid. So in this case, it would be like, like 2,500 meters per second. Um, I would say that's quite fast from left to right sending that information, sending that wave through through this through this metal. And by doing that, um, the surface uh, changes. So you see these bubbles. And these bubbles hit the liquid. And by hitting the liquid, it develops a compression wave. And these are the white beams you see here in this picture. These are compression waves. Um, and when that happens, um, you can see that it's in a specific angle. Now, both angles from the metal and from the fluid can help us because um, these both angles give us uh, the Rayleigh angle. And this Rayleigh angle is directly connected to the density of the liquid. So typically we can use this technology to measure the density of the liquid flowing through the tube. Now, I was also speaking about the speed of sound. And the speed of sound uh, depends on the temperature. Uh, we know exactly the type of material and the speed of sound at a certain temperature of this typical and wall thickness and typical material. If now the temperature is higher, this will affect the speed of sound. It will be lower. And if it's colder, it will be higher. So with this device, we can also measure the temperature. So this interdigital transducer is, I would say, the key to, to the solution of measuring flow with surface acoustic wave. Um, to do this flow measurement, we need a sender and we need a receiver. Um, we have a interdigital transducer uh, made of a piezo material. It's uh, thus it's a pizza T. It's like like a ceramic material, and the structure of this uh, element. Uh, defines the exact uh, frequency we need to do this type of, of measurement. It should, it should be a device which is specifically for this application. Um, we have like about uh, 3,000 megahertz to, uh, to, to do so. Now, here we have this overview. And um, now we go through the, the steps of what's happening directly in, in, this, um, in this flow sensor, if you're measuring flow. 
So we got a sender, an IDT sender, and we got an IDT receiver. And as you can see, we got more of these IDTs installed on the tube. So the first step we do is um, we send from the IDT the first um, lamp wave through the solid through to the IDT receiver. And that's the first one, and that's also the one we use to um, to measure the temperature. Depending on the temperature, we know that it it is different from the standard speed of sound we have calculated. So now we know the temperature. While this lamp wave was going through this solid, through this metal, the lamp wave was creating a compression wave. This is the green line going uh, through this liquid um, and through this liquid uh, with a certain angle. Typically, this angle is specifically for, for the density. That's what you already explained. So now, this um, <coughs> uh, compression wave enters here, the uh, other side of the tube again, and it will couple into the metal tube, and then travel as a lamp wave through the receiver tool. Well, it's creating a lamp wave. The lamp wave is also creating again a compression wave. Here you see the yellow one going up. And there it happens the same. So here we got a lamp wave coupling in through receiver one, and again a compression wave coupling out to the liquid. Lamp wave coupling in, compression wave coupling out, etc. So this is one group measurement, and what we actually are doing is is making a kind of fingerprint of the liquid going through this tube. But we're still not measuring flow. We have temperature, we have density, but we're still not measuring flow. The only thing we need to do now is stop this one and send one group measurement back from receiver one to sender. So now the receiver will be the sender and the sender will be the receiver. And then we measure the time difference. And the time difference is uh, is directly proportional to uh, the flow thro flowing through this tube of this size. So now we're measuring flow. So what we've learned now is that with served acoustic wave, we can measure flow, we can measure temperature, we can measure density, and we can calculate mass flow, um, and we can calculate concentration and viscosity. Um, I have to make a note, we developed this surface acoustic way, uh, wave for f uh, fluids, so let's say liquids. Um, and for the moment we uh, can do this for flow and temperature. Uh, in the lab we have done density and that will be one of the next steps to develop further. So what are the advantages of using a surface acoustic wave technology um, for, for flow measurement? Well, one of them is that there's nothing inside the tube. We're just using a tube, a stainless steel tube, a pharma tube you're using in your, in, your, in your hygienic system. There are no ceiling, no liners, no electrodes, nothing in it. There are no flow influencing effects. There's not a pressure drop at all. Um, there are no inner, inner diameter size adaptions. There are no leakages possible. Um, with that, this measurement starts already measuring at a very low velocity. Actually, we can, we can see if there is a liquid inside. Um, it detects a laminar or turbulent flow. Well, um, engineers or process engineers who are active in, in this field know that you design your system um, to have a turbulent flow at when you're cleaning when you're cleaning it. Now it would be great, of course, if you can get a feedback from your device in your system if it's really a turbulent flow. Um, there are no limits in installation. You can install it um, in any direction you want. Of course, you did need to uh, look into the hygienic design that that it still commits to that, but it doesn't affect the measurement at all. It also doesn't, um, uh, the measurement is also independent from magnetic and electrical effects. Um, electrical and thermic 
properties of the fluid or the conductivity of the fluid, the direction of the flow. Um, actually, it will tell you if it's going left or right. Um, so, from that point of view, I think there's a lot of advantages for using this kind of technology. Um, for the people who uh, are interested, we have later a um, 3D animation available um, where the technology is explained as well. So then you can have a look at that later. We will guide you through that. Now, the industrialization of this technology. Um, of course, that's, I would say, the most difficult part of it. Um, and that's why we also start slow. <laughs> Um, so one of the first applications we have qualified for this device is um, uh, water with low or no conductivity. Um, typically you could see that in pharma applications, food applications or cosmetic applications where they use water with low conductivity um, like purified water or WFI loops. Um, and this is one of the first applications we, we start with. Um, the device will be available in uh, a small range, half inch to DN50 to two inch, um, uh, second quarter of next year. So what you're seeing here is really new. It's a new technology and um, we are really happy to be already that far that we can do um, our, I would say, clinical trials at our customers at the moment to make sure that if we launch it in the market and the industry that um, that it will work well. So um, coming to the next poll, um, maybe I can uh, hand back it to you, Sam. Thank you very much. Yeah, the second and final poll in today's session. Uh, just before we do that, I want to give a quick reminder to the attendees that you can already submit your questions for the Q&A session. So if you start thinking of those and uh, just type them into the questions box at the top left-hand corner and click in Submit, that will send those questions into us. Uh, in terms of the poll at the moment, uh, the poll question and answers are, in which applications do you use flow measurements? Is it A, storage and distribution loop, B, CIP control, C, filling, or D, other. Uh, yeah, and again, John, if you could just talk around this question for a, for a little while. Um, yeah, so we're asking which application do you do you use flow measurement? Um, so what I, what I was we 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 refer to the first poll, of course, with the typical um, sensors you're using, and then in combination with the um, application. Um, and then maybe in your mind, where would you be able to use this type of technology in, in your application? Um, maybe you can look into that and send us some questions in, uh, about that. Okay, thank you very much. So time to move over to the results slide now. And yeah, it's either storage and distribution loop or something else there. So if you could just comment mm -hmm. on that before carrying on. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think I would ex uh, expect this type of uh, of feedback. Um, typically, th this type of measurement is done in stores and distribution loops. Um, there are a lot of other applications where you can do that, but if you have to choose in into these ones, I would say this would be the one. So um, that gives a clear understanding that um, the guys we're talking to now have a good understanding of um, of where they use flow measurement. That's pretty good to see. Then um, I explained you the first step we do. So I would say um, pharma uh, application, low conductivity water. Um, I think we have a good comparison there to Coriolis sensor um, with all these benefits of that. Um, the other applications we want to grow in, uh, for example, is in dairy to measure milk, maybe inlet raw milk, uh, or there are a lot of other applications you can do, um, maybe even measure cream. Um, the technology would allow that to do so. So even at this moment, we are ready into 
uh, qualification for our device in, in dairy applications. Um, then for a uh, brewery, um, of course, it's a really interesting industry. It's still growing. Um, and with that, uh, it also gives some liquids which maybe are a little bit more difficult, maybe even liquids with gas bubbles inside. Um, you've seen that our surface acoustic wave technology offers us a wide beam traveling through the whole surface, the square surface of the liquid. So we typically can uh, see if there is li if there is gas inside this um, this media. Uh, at the moment, we're not that far that we can say exactly 17% is gas, um, but we can do a good estimation. And we're qualifying that as well, and that can be a good information for you as a process uh, controller to to have. Um, and on the other side, we know that a lot of other technologies suffer uh, gas or bubbles uh, in, in as, as in accuracy of the measurement they're doing. And in ours, it won't affect that because we get this full fingerprint of the full surface uh, of, this, of this liquid column flowing through. Um, of course, water um, is a big thing worldwide, um, and um, we do need um, we do need uh, larger sizes for water applications. Uh, as said, from half inch to two inch, it will not be enough for this. But we need to develop our device also for bigger sizes, up to 100 or maybe even 150. Um, these are done, um, or these already planned in our uh, planning and our production planning. So that will come later when uh, we develop this product further. Um, other application, um, I will show you some differences, different applications. Uh, it would be great if we could measure chocolate. Uh, chocolate measurement is really one of the most difficult ones, I would say. And um, um, actually, um, we can measure chocolate with this technology. Um, we have done it in the lab, um, but we're quite far away from the industrialization of it. Um, but if, if you've seen that um, all the um, uh, measurements we can do um, will help us to measure also this different type of liquid. Um, the other one can be, for for example, jam or marmalade. Um, this um, this has, for example, particles inside. Um, and, and typically, that's really difficult to measure, and we have proved uh, that this technology can can measure this type of liquid as well, uh, without affecting uh, the accuracy as well. And this brings us to uh, to an interesting thing, uh, because we are measuring also density, um, uh, and we are able to do viscosity, and we are able to do uh, concentration we have the possibility to do liquid differentiation. Well, the liquid differentiation is, um, is something which we do not have yet uh, in, in installed in our device, um, but that would be very interesting. Um, typically, when you're cleaning a system, you do not want to waste your product you just have uh, produced. And if you can differentiate between CIP um, and your product, very fast, you can save a lot of uh, product you want to sell instead of going it, send it to the waste. So, um, as said, we can do density then and liquid differentiation, um, and maybe even uh, do your process control on that. So, the technology allows us to, to do a lot. We are aware of the fact that we are just in the beginning of this technology, although it's existing already for more than 100 years. Uh, we just started with flow. Um, I would say 
uh, we probably need five to seven years coming to develop our product from only measuring low conductivity water up to uh, the full range of applications I just showed you, so like the sizes and the different type of liquids we can we can measure. Um, I hope this was enough. It um, it is a, we speak about technology, not about a product yet. We're almost there. Um, I hope we gave you uh, enough information to get a good understanding of this surface acoustic wave technology um, and uh, yeah, we will be happy to see you in the second quarter asking for this type of device um, for your for your application um, maybe Sam I can uh, hand it back to you um, to see if there are some questions yeah sure we've had a we've had a couple in already but uh, we've got about 20 minutes or so to to go so uh, you feel free to submit more just by typing them in and then pressing enter uh, but the first one we have is if hi is it possible to use this technology in a single use fashion um, well the, that would be that would be possible um, it would be possible because we use this technology um, uh, and we send this technology we send the uh, surface acoustic wave through a solid and this solid can also be a plastic so um, that's that is it, it would be possible uh, we also understand now after a long time that it's not easy to do so, so I would say theoretically yes it would be possible um, and then the second one is, can you industrialize it? That's the second question. I'm not sure in what time frame we can do that. But typically, from a theoretical point of view, it should be possible. OK, uh, next question is, how can you calibrate uh, SAW meter? Will calibration change from WFI to buffer solution? Um well here here it is is it we we give this device or when we when we deliver this device we do that with all our flow devices we have so we do a calibration in our factory and then we send it out to our customers and then the calibration is is done then when it's at the customer's site and after a certain period they want to see if if it's still giving the value uh, we promise them to do so then you need to to calibrate it and that's typically done by a reference device and that's also the same as you have done by uh, would, would have done by other flow meters you have in your process and um, the calibration then is done but then the question is can you can you adjust it and that's possible uh, that's possible uh, and the same with the other devices you can do that over the software so you can adjust the settings over the software to calibrate it to your application. So yes, that will be possible. Thank you. Uh, next question is, what is the procedure for the calibration of surface acoustic wave flow meter? Do you have a reference instrument that can be used for measuring flow in an independent way? And can this type, uh, can this type a reference standard yeah, what um, actually we we are using Coriolis technology to do our calibration. So if you have a calibrated Coriolis sensor as a reference device, you can use that uh, to calibrate uh, our um, our surface acoustic wave device. Yeah, good question though. Okay, uh, next question, and we're coming towards the end now. So if you do have any, uh, send them in to us as soon as you can. Uh, this next question is, if the mass of liquid can push the waves down, what happens if we have a big pressure in the tube? Um, okay, well, the thing here is um, that um, the density is something else than the pressure. So, um, uh, 
the density affects the angle of the compression wave, um, but the liquid is non-compressible, so that actually will not affect it, so it won't affect our measurement as well. But it's good thinking, yeah. And I think today's final question is, when will this device be available? Um, it's um, planned to do the first step of our delivery second quarter of next year and um, then we will come with um, a half inch to two inch flow wave device um, for um, a low conductivity or non non conductive liquids um, and then in the next years we will come with uh, the new options and and expand the delivery of delivery scope of this device yeah. okay thank you very much everyone for your questions we're going to be finishing slightly earlier today uh, John do you have any comments you want to give before I wrap up today's session um, well I'd like to thank everybody for, for participating and, and the good questions um, we enjoy to do this um, please um, if you thought about any question later uh, get back to us uh, we will be happy to, to answer your questions with regards to this new technology um, I think for the future this will be really a game changer in, in, in engineering in, in using flow sensors in this field um, it's a new technology um, nothing in the tube it gives a lot of advantages especially in the field uh, pharma uh, food and beverage and uh, cosmetic industries Okay, so that just leads me to thank John for what was a great presentation and to thank Berka for sponsoring this session. Uh, to all the attendees, you'll receive an email shortly telling you how you can access the on-demand version of this webinar. Uh, you'll get that in about two hours. Or you can access this through our website, which is www.business-review-webinars.com shortly. Uh, we look forward to sharing further webinars with you, so please keep an eye out on the website I just mentioned. Follow us on Twitter, which is at the R Webinars for daily updates, and join our LinkedIn group, Business Review Webinars. Apart from that, thank you all once again, and I hope you all have a nice day.